Do you get pissed off when you have something that you really like and then they go ahead and change it and add all these unnecessary bells and whistles and just doodads and it's just big and bulky and clunky and you don't even want to use it anymore. It was perfect before and now it's just absolutely terrible. Well, you're in luck because, you know, we feel the same <laughs> way. <laughs> that's what, and, and on top of that, that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode of the Existential Stoic Podcast. That's it. We were just venting. I'm Randy. That's Danny. This is the Existential Stoic Podcast. What's up, Danny? What's up, Randy? Yeah, so just before recording, we were actually about to start another episode. That'll be the episode that comes up next week. Yeah. But we were this is how these about, ideas happen. <laughs> we were talking about how, you know, some software updates and then things that were easy and simple and we knew how to use all of a sudden just where you know, did things You go? do see it all the time. And the, the example I was giving, I think a lot of people will probably know this one is Evernote. When it first came out, lots of people used that app. And I remember using it when it first came out. It was a great app originally. It was but like the it was, first cloud note taking app. Yes, that was and it was simple. It was really yeah. simple when it first came out. I don't remember having a lot of features, but it was like I guess because competition came out, like so somebody saw that and they were like, we could add this feature. So they and then Evernote just started like doing all this stuff and it just got so bloated that it was like, I got this because it was a note app, right? Now you've made it into this thing to do everything. It's like I don't want an everything app. I want a note app. <laughs> like, and it and it lost its functionality as a note app. Like I remember yeah. I was getting so frustrated as it at it at just being a note app, but it didn't work for what I initially got it for. And it was just to uh, but you know, market share and investors and but dude, shareholders, all yeah, that. Everything's like that though. It's like it's weird. It's like we can't even when we make something good, like we don't leave it alone, you know? It's we have to keep because I think and I think that maybe is part of it, right? That you know, the way our market's set up is like there's this impulse that like you can't just have a product that stays stagnant. It has to keep developing, changing, or people won't use it. Like and it's a shame because I would have been happy with Evernote if they never changed it. All they could have done was like security updates and like, you know, updates for like new hardware and stuff. But other than that, just leave it as is. Well, I, I mean, I notice this a lot, too. You see all these car companies trying to cover every model of car. Like now Lamborghini has an SUV and it's just like and Porsche has an SUV. And it's like, why on earth not... would you buy a Porsche or a Lamborghini SUV? That's the most stupid thing, in my opinion. Yeah, because like, they have nothing. Well, they have thing. nothing to do. With those yeah. types of vehicles, their brand has nothing to do with them. Like, yeah. and if you were going to do it, make another brand and then do it from there. <laughs> Don't make it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like the biggest waste of money, in my opinion, again, to buy one of those because, like, Porsche is known for a sports car. Lamborghini is n- known for a supercar. It's like not, it's it's just crazy. And yeah. I mean, even their regular supercars really are an insane purchase in terms of cost. Yeah, it's just. Mm-hmm. It is funny, though, but it is it's that idea, I think, that you have to have like, I don't know, we always seem to think that more is better. And I think that is the problem. Like, we forget that, like, there's a value in simplicity, right? And knowing what to expect, knowing what's going to be there, you know? Did you? I, you just talked about value of simplicity, already bringing us back to the topic. Yeah, again. trying wow. to keep us on track. <laughs> well, that, it's interesting because I think you hit the nail on the head earlier where you're talking about how, like, everything has to keep growing and expanding and getting bigger and it's that's not the way that things have always been like it's also not sustainable (laughs) at all it's it's interesting because like in terms of business which everybody thinks is the best thing because we all worship at the altar of money business is the greatest thing ever you always need to have every quarter needs to be better than the last always growing and it's like there are no natural things that grow forever except for cancer and like we have wars on cancer and everybody's <laughs> fighting cancer. And it's like, but in business, this is really good. And it's like, what is it? Maybe That's funny. It's There's a, um, a philosopher. Uh, God, I can't remember his name right now. He, he's the guy who created a uh, so, um, social ecology. It's environmental, environmental ethic approach. Oh, okay. I can't remember his name, but he talks about the idea of grow or die. This concept in in our in our business practices, where like if a business is not growing, it's failing, right? Like you can't have a business that's just performing well. It has to constantly be maximizing, ten xing. And what he talks about is like how that is such well in his con in the context of you know the environment, right? How it's unsustainable, and how it leads to monopolization, and how it leads to predatory behavior because you just keep right, you just have to keep growing, so you're willing to do anything and just waste stuff constantly instead of building like something good. They build stuff to break, you know, they build stuff and they just keep hmm. buying other companies and all this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, 
Yeah, I, I like that. That made me think of something because I've I've heard like Tony Robbins talk about this thing also <clears throat> how you're either growing or you're dying, and it's just like yeah. maybe that's true, but you know there are cycles in life. You can't always be growing unless you're a cancer, and yeah. so like in order, yeah, there's like an ebb and a flow. And in the Tao Te Ching, it talks about it all the time. There's a season for everything, yeah. and so like yeah. sometimes you do need to grow, but then sometimes you don't need to grow. You need to shrink. And it's just like, we, we vilify this whole shrinking. Like, you know, if, if you're not happy, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, all these things, like they're terrible. And how, Oh my gosh, yeah. you need to fight, fight depression, fight cancer, fight anxiety, fight this. And fight everything. Like, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah. But you know, you know what I hate about so No, it's a good point though. It's like the mental health stuff too. Is like what I hate about so much of our approach to it is it's influenced by the market. Because they want you to go out and buy crap. They want you to go out and distract yourself. And like, so all these things, instead of actually helping people, they're trying to push them to just buy more, purchase more. Maybe they're unhappy because they didn't take the trip. Maybe they're unhappy because they didn't get the new credit. You know, it's like, instead of like, actually like looking at yourself and asking, well, maybe things are too hectic. Maybe there's too much crap in my life. Maybe I need to downsize or, you know, take time to do something else. Because I think the thing about simplicity too is like, I think sometimes when we, focus more on the simple that's when we get really good at things too because we narrow in on stuff and do it a lot do it well you know it makes life i think in a lot of ways our days more consistent and manageable and you know we have a better sense of what to expect with simplicity yeah absolutely um it's so like this whole i'm I'm listening to this book right now it's like it's one of those books that like you listen to and it just kind of changes uh you, you do you have like a whole mind shift yeah yeah every once in a while it's called feeling great it's by this guy he also wrote a book called feeling good i don't know what Wait, it's called is. feeling what feeling great okay and he wrote, and he wrote feeling first, good as well wrote, <laughs> for like 20 years ago he wrote feeling good okay. and but it's like he he talks a whole bunch of stuff and he was talking about like anxiety and depression and they come based from this thought that i'm not good enough and like yeah. as i was listening to that it just completely clicked because we live in a culture nowadays where like anxiety and depression are everywhere. But we live in a culture where nonstop you're getting messaged and marketed to nonstop everywhere you look, billboards, TV ads, phone, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere that other people are better than you. Oh, and, like, and, and it's verifiable by photos because, you know, they have more money, they have better cars, their body looks better, their partners are better, their families are happier, everything. And it's just like, you just have this nagging thought all day. I'm not good enough. I'm not keeping up. There's well, something wrong with me. And it's like, no wonder we have depression and anxiety. Yeah. See, because there's no way for everybody to, it, we focus on the 0.0001%. And there's no way, first of all, there's no way for everybody to live that way. It would be, in, it would be ridiculous. I mean, we wouldn't have enough supplies. Literally, we wouldn't have enough materials for everyone to live like that. It's so wasteful. But everybody yeah, I mean, gets a Lambo. But yeah, right. Everybody. <laughs> But, you know, you hear all these stories, too. Like, you know, you hear of, like, I think Taylor Swift was recently in the news for using her jet so much. Or, like, Elon Musk, like, using his personal jet to fly. Like, I think it was, like, you know, like, twice a day some days, you know, like, because they'll take their jet for, like, a 30-minute flight. And it's, like, this just, like, almost, for most people, an un- unimaginable, like, wealth and excess. And, you know, it's idolized. And I think that is a huge problem. Like, you know, like... <clears throat> you can't just get a house. You want the biggest house and you want this, you know, it's like, and it just makes your life also more complicated and harder. But you're right. I think that's, I think that's where like most of this depression and anxiety comes from. It's from this feeling of inadequacy, feeling of failure because you can't measure up to everyone in the world. Nobody ever does. Like even before the internet, there was Einstein. Most other thinkers didn't measure up to Einstein, right? Like, you know, but they didn't have to get it shoved in their face every day. Like every time they woke up, it was like, Hey, here's a new paper, but you know, like right in their face, like on a screen or something. And I think that's part of it. You can, you could turn away from stuff back then Mm -hmm. or you weren't just aware of it. You know, like it was some far off thing. Like you knew, like I'm sure like people in the middle ages, they knew the King existed and had lots of stuff, but they didn't see him all the time. You know, And they weren't constantly like watching them nonstop. Yeah. They weren't constantly turning their face gorged himself on whatever <laughs> yeah it, it, it it's interesting because it happened to me today where like 
I've been I've been lifting for a while and so I'm getting a little bit bigger and I'm like all right starting to get some muscle and like then you, you know, saw so some starting... bars in you <laughs> Well, that, so that's the thing. Like, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm not like the weakest person at the gym. And I'm like, yeah. And then this dude who's clearly on steroids, but just like jacked out of his freaking mind and zero body fat, he walks by and like instantly I felt just like inadequate. Like, yeah, moments picks before up the bar was, you were lifting with like his pinky. Moments like, before I was feeling like awesome. And then he walked by and just like instantly felt inadequate. And I was just like, wow, that's crazy. But then I was thinking, you know, there's always, no matter. He probably has the same like body dysmorphia as well. Yeah. He walks by and yeah. he sees some other dude who has something that he wants and he just feels like completely worthless. And it's just like there's always going to be people who have what you don't have. So there yeah. in lies the value of simplicity and defining what's valuable to you. When we were when I started working out at Texas Tech, because I never, never worked out before. And this was in grad school and I was working out with a friend. Dude, I remember you went yeah. there like skinny dude, as I weighed hell, about 120. I weighed 120 when I went there. And then I, when I came, yeah, I was like 155 when I came back. So that's a big, that's 35 pounds of just, you know, basically muscle. Yeah, but when I first went to the gym, because I'd never been in, I weighed like 120. Like, I couldn't even lift the bar by itself, really. Because, like, I had yeah. no stabilizer muscles, you know, I never did. But there was a, one of my favorite things there was these two guys who, and they were there every time. I mean, we went six days a week, and they were always there. And I wanted to ask them, and they were there, like, because they were professional bodybuilders or whatever. That's what they did. But they were there like they spent like six to eight hours. A that was their job. But they'd always be like looking in the mirror, the two of them, like looking at each other. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but they were super nice. But it's just cracking up. It's like that's like I would see them. I'd be like, man, they are so huge. Those like they were ridiculous. But like, you know, when I asked them, I was like, oh, that's because you're spending eight hours a day. Like That's a lot. Most people cannot dedicate that time because they're mm -hmm. professionals. And I think that's what we forget, too. We compare ourselves because it's so easy now. You can access so much information. It's so easy to compare yourself, but we're comparing ourselves. Really, it's such an unfair comparison we're making. You know, we're making up comparisons to people that really have a totally different lifestyle than us, totally different life, or we don't know anything about them. And so like, you know, yeah, they might be bigger than you or they might have more money, but you don't know what they're doing, what they went through or anything. And like, you know, it makes it hard to make that comparison. Yeah, I had like two moments in my life when I saw the how worthless it is to go after like money so one one when i was younger there was this dude alex becker who at the time he was worth like 10 million now he's worth a lot more than that but i followed him I learned how to, yeah, yeah I, I learned seo from him and uh just one day by random chance i ran into him like downtown dallas i was there for a conference and just was walking by and i recognized his tattoo i was just like blown away completely starstruck so First like I, I yeah. wanted to talk his ear off. He wanted to leave as soon as possible. <laughs> He's like, God like, damn it. Yeah. But I, I asked him how, because he was like, I had never met a millionaire before in my life. So like, and he's like worth 10 million or whatever. And so I was like, dude, what does it feel like to be rich? Because to me, this was like, this is well, this be is, the, this the goal, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like this, this would have solved in my mind, this would have solved every problem that I ever had. Like, happily ever after i just need to be rich and then it would be it and he like without batting an eye he was just like it feels the same as it did to be broke and yeah. I, I was my mind just like broke i was just like yeah. what yeah. how is that possible you're rich like but yeah it's crazy and then like elon musk i, I read his uh or i listened to his most recent biography and in it in the end of it like the author asked him, he was like, what would you say to people who want to be the next Elon Musk? And he's like, careful what you wish for, because as nice as it all looks, it's not that great on the on the subjective experience of it. Yeah, because he's and still so, miserable, you know, and like, yeah. well, it's funny. I went to my undergrad college. I don't know why, but it had like a lot of kids from really wealthy people for some reason. I'm not sure. I don't know what that reasoning was or why that happened. But like like Tom, you know, I knew Tom Clancy's mm -hmm. son yeah. there and all we were friends. But it, it was funny because I noticed, like, I knew a few kids whose parents were worth, like, it, it just insane amounts of money. Like, Tom Clancy at the mm -hmm. time was worth uh, quite a bit. I'm sure he's, you know, it's more now, but whatever. But none of them were happy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, I mean, and these were kids who had, like, they had platinum credit cards that they could go, they could literally go buy. I mean, literally, they could go buy anything. And it would just get paid for, no questions asked. Like, you know, really most people's dream, right? And they were totally miserable, like all of them, you know, had so many yeah. problems. Like, and it's 
you know, it makes you realize that it's just not, that is not the solution. Yes. And when, when you're, and I get it. Cause like when you're broke, cause I've been there and in debt, like, you know, m money seems like it'll solve everything, you know, and it seems appealing, but the reality is, it's like, yes, it'll solve those immediate problems, but you still have you to deal with. And you mm -hmm. have to deal with that too. And most people, I think as they earn money, they just use it as a way to ignore themselves more and more. And then it just gets worse and worse. The problem compounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting mind experiment because like for a lot of people, we were talking about this earlier, how like, you know, they just buy stuff to make themselves feel better. And that's kind of how the whole business cycle works because they just yeah. convince us that if we buy stuff, we'll feel better and we just go out and buy stuff and it temporarily does make us feel better. It scratches that itch. But like, if you just imagine that you have all the money in the world and then you can just go buy everything, well, sure, then you buy everything. But then all of a sudden, it just loses its luster because you're like, I keep buying stuff and it's not filling that void. Like, yeah, it's not doing anything, on? right? It just makes yeah. you feel worse after a while. And you have no, yeah, the stuff has no real attachment to you at all because it doesn't matter. None of it matters. You know, it's like almost like it makes things meaningless <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way. Oh, totally. Yeah, it is crazy, though. It's crazy. You know, it always it always blew my mind because you also see how, like, I think like that striving after money. It's like such an addiction because you see, like, these people, you know, you can just I mean, you can anybody can look up, you know, like all these people like were younger and like, you know, had a breakout business. They got lucky. Something, especially like the dot com boom and stuff. They make a ton of money from selling it. And like most like any normal person, I think, would like stop at that point. But they don't because it's like it's like an addiction. It's like, now you have to do something else to make more money, to get more money. But like, mm -hmm. you can't use it all. Well, dude, it's, it's workaholism, no different yeah. than alcoholism it or is. any other yeah. addiction. Like people are just addicted to it and because it feels good. Well, but, it does. Uh, I get it. Like, it's yeah. like, you can attach your value very easily. It's very easy to attach our value to external things like our achievements, our wealth, because they're measurable, right? Like you can look and say, I have X number of dollars or I have X number of worth or I, I've accomplished those things and it feels good. But like at the same time, that's not really, you know, you. <laughs> yeah. Here's another thought that I had while listening to that book. This has been making me think a whole bunch. Cause like, you know, no, like good. a lot of people, when they set out on their goals to earn all this wealth, they have a, they have an idea of what it'll do. Like, you know, maybe when they were in elementary school or something, People talk down to them or beat them up or whatever it is. And all of a sudden they're like, I'm going to be the richest person ever because then they'll respect me or some, or they make up something like that. And then they get all the money and guess what? Those people don't care. Yeah. And, and so like their whole, like they never get that feeling of satiety from accomplishing it. It's just a goal that just never gets fulfilled. Well, it's funny too, because I think that's one of the worst things we do too, is like you make your, you're trying to prove something to somebody else. But most of the time, those other people don't give a shit. About okay. <laughs> they don't. They don't have time. They don't even care. You're not even on the radar. So that's yeah. yeah. It's like making comparisons outside of ourselves, and then also like wanting others to notice us. Not going to work. <laughs> I experienced that so hardcore this past week because like I just I just failed an exam big time, and it was like it was a very like I I put a lot of value on passing this exam, even though it was like almost impossible, but. And and so I was so conscious of how other people would judge me because I didn't pass the exam. And then I was like sitting around one day and I was like, nobody's going to even care. Like, no, nope. there are a few people who <laughs> there are a few like you and my brother would probably be supportive. But like most people just won't even care. Like it, they'll yeah. be like, so did you take that exam? I'll be like, oh, yeah, I failed it. And they'd be like, oh, yeah. So I just went to a concert this weekend and, <laughs> yeah. and like they'll just go on about themselves. Like nobody Cause cares. Because it happens. Because yeah. it happens. And like, you know, and it's not. Also, you know, I think stuff like that, too, where, like, we think people will care. It's not something like, like, if you were getting treated for cancer or something, that's like, yeah, people would care if the treatment went well or not, because you're talking about, like, your life. But this is, like, it's a test. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's cool. Like, I hoped you would have passed. But, like, at the same time, it's like, it's not the end of the world either. You can always redo it. You know, you can do a do-over or take a mulligan, as they say, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's also part of it is we, we put, we start to like overvalue these things or think they matter so much. And I think that's a good point too, is we also think that other people see us in relation in the same way that we see ourselves in relation to the successes and failures. And they really just don't. It's like the embarrassment thing, you know, like when you do something that's embarrassing at a restaurant or something and people see you and you feel like everyone's looking at you. But the reality is, is no one remembers it. 
Or at best, if they do, they tell the story incorrectly and probably get you totally wrong in it, you know? <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah. it's... I have another experience of that where like I always hate when I have to go and say I'm sorry. Like even even when I'm wrong, I'm just like, oh gosh, I of course I have to go and say I'm sorry. And then But like I'm never somebody will wrong. say that yeah, and then somebody will say they're sorry to me, and I'm just like, Oh yeah, don't worry about it. But it's Yeah. like that's probably the same exact experience that they're doing when I'm going through Oh, dude. all this like mental turmoil to go say sorry to them. I do And they're all just the like, time Yeah, whatever, with stuff it doesn't like, matter. dude, anything like, especially like, like anything with like interpersonal relationships, like I'll stress about it so much. And then it's like, but the reality is if you just do it and get it over with, like, it always makes it better. Because like, even if it's something bad, it's out in the open and it's easier to deal with, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that that works with simplicity, too. It's just simple, just doing things, getting them <laughs> simplifying, you know, making Mm things easier for yourself and stop stressing. Yeah, -hmm. yeah we're good and also at complicating like a lot stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh goodness yeah uh, also so like a lot of stuff we talked about about is helpful from kind of in simplifying kind of determining what your values are what's important to you and and stop trying to do everything because You know, it's fun. you just can't yeah Yeah, I think about that a lot. Like I, I used to write down like, well, I still do, but like my goals and stuff. And I, and then I started thinking about like, what does happiness really look like? What is like a good, a good future really look like to me? And when I was younger, I think like everybody else, because I think everybody else at the time too, like, you know, if you had asked me like, what do you want when you grow up? Like I would have said like, oh, I want a big house. I want like nice cars and stuff. And it's funny because now I look and I look back at my notebook at like what I say. And it's like, I want to. smallish house not like tiny but like you know not huge because that's just more crap to take care of and rooms to fill up which i know amounts to more stuff i don't want or need you know and like some land and like kind of far away you know what i mean like it's not fabulous or glamorous because i don't really want that and like i don't really and like and i think people don't think of that either like they might idolize like elon musk or like these celebrities and stuff but like do you really want People to be taking photos of you all the time for everything you do to be scrutinized online for every Mm -hmm. move you make to be registered and checked boxed and whatever, you know, I mean, yeah, Yeah. crazy. Yeah, you can't go anywhere without people like I remember one time uh my family was having breakfast the same place and Lou Ferrigno was also having breakfast at Oh, home. nice. And That's awesome. dude, and so like we kept looking out over at him. Everybody else in the restaurant was looking at him. And he's probably And it's hard just like to miss, right? the man was just trying to eat in peace, and everybody's literally just looking at him and then going to get autographs and like pictures and all this stuff. And And they it's can just be, like, and like some of those guys, yeah. like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Some of the celebrities are super nice about it too. Like they understand the situation and they're polite, but at the same time, it's gotta be annoying as hell. Right. Like, yeah. And like, they also, and it's gotta be tough too. Cause like, especially like actors, like they know like their, their wealth is dependent upon their being liked. So like, do you want to be nice? But at the same time, it's like, you also are living a life, you know, Mm plus hmm. Yeah, there dude. was a really good movie with uh, Ray Romano and Eminem, and it was like it was like a, a story, but it was them talking as if they were the real person, like their actual person. And so Eminem was just talking about how terrible it was to be as famous as he, as he was, because he's like, dude, I can't even go to Walmart. Like, No, you can't do anything. <laughs> I'm just stuck at home. I can't do anything. And yeah, You have to have it's people crazy. go out and shop for you and stuff. You can't Yeah. do things that normal people do because it's like that would create a huge, you know, scene basically everywhere you go. And like, you know, you can try. And if you try to hide yourself, that makes it probably even worse because then people are like, Is that him? <laughs> like trails of people following you. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Mm -hmm. too <laughs> yeah. much. So, so anyways, that's uh that's pretty much it in terms of the art of simplicity. We didn't really talk about it too much, but we talked about it a little We should bit. live And simple. maybe we talked about why excess <laughs> is bad. yeah. And and, and then you can That figure also, out the counterfactual yeah. to that. Yeah. There you go. There That's you go. the right way to look at it. So if you enjoyed it, you know. like the episode we have a whole we have hundreds of episodes you can listen to so if you're Yeah, literally. going on a car ride somewhere you just want to download a whole bunch of podcasts go for it and uh check us out every week this is the existential stoic podcast i'm randy that's danny i'll see you later danny Later, Randy.